Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 11 through 13. I'm reading from the the, uh, NIV this morning. It says this, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let's read that again together, if you don't mind. So so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. For what? To equip his people for works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith, and knowledge of the Son of God, and that we become mature to what end? To attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we just ask that now you would add your blessing to the reading and the preaching of your word. I pray, God, that you would help us to hear what you have to say to us today. And Lord, that you would help us to respond appropriately. God, we want to live a life that, that reflects the relationship that we have with you. Lord, we want to serve your purposes and advance your kingdom. And I pray that you lead us and guide us to your truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I am not ashamed to tell you that I love fall. It is my favorite season of the year. Uh, If you took a poll around this nation, I believe that what you would find is despite the fact that there are four seasons every year, that I think fully half of the people that you ask would say that fall is their favorite season. And and because I'm an old math teacher and I hate to pass up a chance at doing some statistics, I want you to raise your hand. If fall is your favorite time of the year, would you raise your hand, please? Look at all of that. I love to be proven right in public. And I hate to be humiliated, so may, thank you for liking fall. Th- there are a lot of reasons to like fall. The weather's usually cooler, which means you don't have a heat stroke when you walk out to the car, which is always a good thing. There's their there fall festivals, if you like that kind of thing. Bring people together, and people, people like that. Now, now, for some, it's the fact that the holidays are coming. Sorry about that. The holidays are coming, and people get excited about that. And for others, it's the colors and the smells and the flavors of fall. So it's the oranges and the reds and the yellows. It's the, it's the pumpkin and the cinnamon and the nutmeg. I don't know if those are flavors or smells, but you just, there you go. Maybe today it wouldn't matter. I can't taste or smell it. But either way, if you like those, there you go. All of that plays into making fall fun. But for a lot of people, what makes fall their favorite season is the fact that it is football season. Amen. I thought I'd have a few holy hallelujahs on that. Thank you very much. Now, basketball was a good distraction during the spring and, and, and the winter. Baseball was good for, for the summer, unless you're a Braves fan, and then it was not so good. But it, it was at least a distraction. But, but it's football that really brings out the best, and dare I say the worst, of people in the South. I mean, uh, you get otherwise normal people. I mean, like real nice, polite Christian people. And they will rip your throat out <laughs> if you say the wrong thing about their team. And that's, ju- that's just the rec league team. I mean, that's just the, t- the flag football team. If you talk about their high school or their college now, there's some serious verbal smackdowns going on. I mean, Blaine's here. Blaine, they get called to the rec department from time to time to break up fights about flag football. It's a serious deal. Maybe not that serious, but it's a serious deal. But, but it's something to look forward to, and it's something to get excited about, and it's something to bring people together, and, and it's something to have fun with, and, and I love every minute of it. I have wondered this, though. If, if you were, maybe you were, had never seen a football game before, and you were floating over the field in, uh, in the Goodyear blimp, and you look down on of all the chaos that is going on below, I wonder if you didn't know what was going on, I wonder what you would think. I mean, you look at all that, and you, uh, you're trying to figure out what's going on through the eyes of people that have never seen a football game before. I think w- among the things that you might conclude, what, you would, what would strike you is this, is there are 90,000 people who desperately need exercise sitting down, watching 22 guys run around who desperately need rest. 
and it makes no sense whatsoever. But that's what you'd see. Now there are if you you're saying, now I don't really understand football, I don't really get this. So today I'm going to I'm going to explain this to you. Okay, I'm gonna so guys, if you've been trying to help your your wives with this, or wives, if you've been trying to help your husbands with this, here you go, I'm gonna help you out. Okay, so there are some variables about, uh, variables about how this works with each team, but in general, here's a pretty common picture of how this football game thing operates. So you have a team of eleven players, and those those eleven have the ball, and they are trying to accomplish a goal. That there is a goal line that must be crossed in order for them to know that the goal has been accomplished. They will run a series of plays in order to move the ball down the field towards the goal. Now, sometimes they're going to run the ball, sometimes they're going to pass the ball, but they're always trying to move closer and closer to their goal. Now, that doesn't sound too difficult until you understand that there is an opposing team. There are 11 other players who are attempting to prevent any movement of the ball towards the goal. Everybody with me now? So the opposing team will do anything they can. They're going to block, tackle, trip, disrupt, intercept, or otherwise prevent any progress of the team towards the goal. You say, so how does the team move the ball towards the goal? Well, they have to come up with a plan. There has to be a plan. Somebody, namely a coach, has to develop a game plan that's designed to overcome the opponent's schemes. So <clears throat> then the coaching staff teaches the players that game plan throughout the week. And when the game starts, there's somebody way up high, somebody up in the press box who, who's looking down. They have a great perspective on what is actually going on. And that person sees what's happening, and they, say, they send word down to the sidelines to the coaches. And then the coaches call the right plays at the right time, and the players follow those, those plays because they trust that the coaches have heard from that person up there who knows exactly what's going on. Now, if the players aren't doing something right, the coaches will pull them off the field. Y'all have seen this. They'll pull them off the field, sometimes one at a time. Sometimes they'll stop the whole game long enough to get everybody together, to make, ev make sure everybody knows what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. And, and now, again, that sounds like it should work great. But, th but these plays get a little complicated sometimes because of the work of the opposing team. So every player has a different role to carry out in, for in order for the play to to be successful. Now, some of the big guys will stand in front of the quarterback and keep the opposing players at bay while the quarterback gets the play going. Now, sometimes he'll hand it to one of the small, fast guys to run the ball. That has never happened to me, I, I, but I hear that's what they do there in the backfield. Sometimes he'll pass the ball to the tall, fast guy, uh, with the, the, the quick dude that, that has good hands over, they'll throw the ball to him. But if everybody doesn't do their part, the play is going to fail and they're not going to reach their goal. Now, given the fact that we're sitting in a church sanctuary and given the fact that I'm wearing a Georgia shirt and many of you are wearing other jerseys, then, then uh, you, you intelligent people have probably already spotted some parallels between the game of football and the way that church is supposed to operate. As a matter of fact, the scripture that we just read begins to spell out the, the game plan for us. It says that Jesus himself gave gifts to the church. Now, we spent a couple, a few months ago, we spent, oh, eight weeks or so talking about the gifts of the Spirit. These are the gifts of Jesus. The gifts of Jesus to the church. Now, what gifts did Jesus give to the church? As a matter of fact, he gave five gifts to the church. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Now, these have varying functions, and we've defined some of these in the past. So they've got varying functions, but, but the bottom line is these are church staff type people. Would you agree with me? These are church staff type people. These are people who tend to have an office at the church. These are, these are people who tend to, have, to be behind the pulpits and the podiums in the churches across the land. Now, the, now the, in the minds of the American church, these are the people who get paid to do the work of the ministry. Is that not the common understanding of what church staff is supposed to do? This is yes, this is no. Do you understand? That's how most people see the church staff. Am I right? They are, the, they are the people who get paid to do the work of the ministry. They are the players on the field. The body gives the money. The pastors do the work. It's a fabulous system. It is a fabulous system except for, for one thing, or maybe two things, and here's the problem. First of all, the system doesn't work. 
That system does not work. You say, oh, it works pretty good for me. I think you're doing a pretty good job, John. <laughs> Here's the problem. The system doesn't work, and all you have to do is look around at the American culture, and you understand that the church is not impacting American society. We are not moving the ball. We are not winning the game. And we're not winning the game because the system is broken. Here's the second problem. The system is unbiblical. The system is unbiblical. It, 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 nowhere in the New Testament does it advocate that the work of the ministry be carried out by hired hands who work in place of or on behalf of anybody else. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 2 and verse 10, which we love to quote because it says that we are God's masterpiece. If you read the whole verse, it says that we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good work. That's a four-letter word in America, work. But that's what we were created, or as Jesus said, we were recreated in Christ Jesus and for Jesus to do good work. All of us have to do the work of the ministry. Now, according to the scriptures that we just read, the, what were the five gifts? The, the, what were the, the church staff, if you will? What was the church staff given to the church to do? Uh, Janice, if you will, is that still you, Janice? I can't see Hey, hey, Janice, how you doing? So um, verse 12 says this. He, so verse 11 says he gave these five gifts. Why? To equip his people for the works of service. Equip the people for works of service. We are to train others to accomplish the goals of ministry. In our football analogy, we're the coaches. We're the coaches. The problem in the American church is that we've been putting our coaches on the field while our players are at best on the sidelines and, and, and maybe at worst they're sitting in the stands complaining that they paid good money to see a good game but, but these knuckleheads are losing the game. And so what most churches do is that we fire the knuckleheads and we hire some all-stars. I mean, we go out and we, we pay big money and we get the good ones. We get the thoroughbreds who are going to really do it right. And we may have to pay a little more to get those guys, but, but that's okay. If the ticket prices go up for us or concessions go up for us, it's okay. But we got some, we got some winners. The problem is, is when you, you take those three or four or five all-stars and you trot them out on the field uh, against a full team of 11 opponents... Eventually, even the all-stars are going to lose. Y'all following me? <laughs> are you already mad at me? I'll give you a hamburger if you'll just stay with me. <laughs> the goal of the church was set by Jesus. And after almost three years, if you don't know what the goal of the church is by now, I I'm going to quit and go home, I think. The goal of the church is to go and do what? Make disciples. Thank you, because I really didn't want to go anywhere else. So the goal of the church is to go and make disciples. That's what we're striving for. That's a touchdown for us. That's a win for us, is going and making disciples. And the only way that we're going to reach that goal is to follow the game plan of the purpose up in the booth above us. He knows, uh, he knows the enemy. He knows the goal. He sees the game. And that person in the booth up there knows the best way to get this thing done. And he, is gonna, he told us right here in this passage that if we ever expect to win the game, if we ever expect to go and to make disciples, we'd better follow the game plan that Jesus laid out for us in this passage. It says Jesus himself called people to positions of leadership like pastors and teachers in order to teach everyone else how to do the work of the ministry. We're the coaches. You're the players. And what did, what did Jesus say would happen if we did that? If the coaches coach and the players play, what did he say was going to happen? Let's look at this. Verse 12 said he's going to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That's a good thing, right? The body of Christ gets built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And we become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's discipleship. 
That's what we've been shooting for. In other words, the way for us to go and to make disciples is for us to get busy about the, the, the work of the kingdom, to get everybody doing what they're supposed to be doing, and then we get maturity and fullness and unity. And that's what we've been shooting for the whole time. If we'll go and make disciples, then we can expect to cross the goal line with a big, strong, mature, unified body of Christ. Now, some of you might be thinking, now, hang on just a second, because somebody's got to sit in the stands and cheer the team on, right? Some of y'all volunteering to be cheerleaders already. You're just going to sit in the stands and, and cheer the team on. Well, who gets to do that in the body of Christ? Well, the Bible tells us that, and it's in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and then it tells us what to do. Those who are on the field, it tells us what to do. But, but it, the imagery here by the writer of Hebrews is very clear. It is, a, it is a Roman Colosseum. The activity, the game, the event is going on on the field. And then who, these people who are playing the game, who are participating, are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Well, who are these people who get to sit in the stands? Well, if you'll back up, this is chapter 12, verse 1. Back up to chapter 11, it's what we call the hall of fame of faith. It's people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It's people like Gideon and David and Rahab. It's people who have, who have gone before us and who have paid the way for us to obtain such a great salvation. They laid their lives down for the cause of Christ. And so the only people who get to cheer are dead people who have already paid for their seat and who are now cheering us on to do what Jesus called us to do. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that you are hearing my voice tells me and should tell you that there is no place for you in the stands. Every one of us has a place on the team. Every one of us has a place on the field. Every one of us has a role that we can play. Every one of us is called and gifted and anointed by God to get on the field and to do something to help the team reach the goal. Now, I know the analogy is football today, and some of you are thinking it's far too silly a thing to make a spiritual example out of it. But let me tell you this. I understand the analogy is football, but this contest that we're engaged in as Christians is far more important than a game. As much as I love football, I love, I love the kingdom of God more. The stakes in what we're participating in could not be greater. This is not about winning and losing a ball game. This is about eternity. This is a matter of heaven and hell for people. So the stakes cannot be greater. How much longer can we sit in the stands and watch? How much longer can our pulpits remain silent about the game plan that he gave us? How much longer will we allow our coaches to to play and our players to sit. You see, I'm tired of losing. There's no fun to be on a losing team. I'm tired of losing. I'm tired of the church fumbling the ball. I'm ready for a big, fully formed, united body of Christ to rise up and get in the game. I'm ready to push back on the opponent. I'm ready to, to knock some defenders on their little spiritual tails. I'm, I'm ready to do a celebration dance in the devil's end zone. Jesus said the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So what are we waiting for? We've been guaranteed the victory. Who doesn't want to play a game that you've already won? So what are we waiting? Why in the world would we not want to get involved in that? Well, one of the reasons that people don't play the game is because every time we see football on TV, they look hot and tired. They look bloody and, and banged up. And we see video of these guys that practice for like three hours a day. And it's, if, if, they're, if they're southern teams, man, it's like 94 degrees and they're in full pads and they're beating the snot out of each other. And it's, it just, does it look like fun? No. <laughs> no, Steve. <laughs> Normal people say no. It does not look like fun. It, it, it looks like work. It looks inconvenient. These guys were not just laying there in the bed at 4 o'clock in the morning thinking, I think I'm going to go lift weights. They're, li they're, they're lifting small cars at 5 o'clock in the morning. They didn't do that because they didn't have anything better to do. They're doing it for a purpose. You see, it's inconvenient to get involved in the work of the ministry. It's far more fun 
and far more convenient to sit in the stands than it is to get on the field. And the problem is, from the spiritual perspective, is that Jesus didn't save anybody to be fans. He saved us and changed us to be on the field, to be players and coaches, to be participating. If we're followers of Jesus, we've got to get involved. We've got to get on the field. You see, part of the problem, part of the reason that people don't, don't want to get on the field, they don't want to get involved, is, is they see the players out on the field and they think, well, they've got players. They don't need me. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. You, you, just because you've got a good starting lineup doesn't mean that, that people don't need a break from time to time. You, you've seen some of these guys every once in a while, you, you, get, a, you get an offense that's a hurry-up offense, and they, they only take like 12 seconds between plays. It's not going to be long before the fat boys on defense are doubled over, and they're waving at the sidelines and saying, could you send somebody in? Just send a cheerleader in. Send somebody in so I can go breathe for a second. Just because there's a good starting lineup doesn't mean that people don't get tired. It doesn't mean that people don't get hurt. It doesn't mean that people don't need a break. So what you have to have, if there's nobody on the sidelines ready to go in, if there's nobody who's been at practice all week, if there's nobody who, under, who knows the plays, nobody who understands the game plan, if nobody like that's on the sideline, how's the team going to function? How's the team going to move the ball in a sustained drive? They may be able to do it for a few minutes, but eventually somebody's going to have to be swapped out. We've got to have additional players. So don't look at the starting lineup and say, well, they got their team. They're good. We need players. Every team needs extra players. The other problem is you look at, you look at those players and you think, well, I'm not fast. I can't run the ball like that. Man, they'd kill me. You look, I, I got, I'm all thumbs. I can't catch the ball. Well, look, maybe you're the holder while the kicker kicks the field goal. Or, or maybe, maybe you're a lineman that blocks for the quarterback. There's lots and lots of gifts that God has given people. You just have to get out there and let the coaches know that you're available and then trust them to find you a spot. Man, we just need, we just need a whole bunch of players to stay after school and just show up on the field and just say, okay, coach, I'm ready. You just show me what you want me to do. And the coach says, what you good at? He says, I don't know what I'm good at. I may not be good at anything, but I'm here. I'm ready to go. And it's the coach's job then to take those players and to teach them and to show them and to train them on how to run the plays that's going to win the game. Now next year, uh, next year, next week, I'm going to share vision with you. And I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to you about where I believe God wants us to go as a congregation and who he wants us to be. I'm going to tell you how we can grow and how we can increase our influence in this community. And I don't want you, I want you to come, but here's a spoiler. I want, you, I want you to know this before you come. There is no way to accomplish the vision that God has given me for this church without you. There is no way for this church to be who it's supposed to be in this community without you. Can at least five people say amen? amen. Thank you very much. There is no way that we can accomplish and be who God wants us to be without each other. I, as the pastor, we as the church staff, we have to do a better job of training you and coaching you and getting you in the right place and equipping you for the work of the ministry. It's the only way the church is going to grow. And more importantly, it's the only way the body of Christ is going to grow. And do you know what? It's the only way that you're going to grow. If you're not serving, you're not growing. You say, John, I don't think I like that. You got some scripture for that? As a matter of fact, I do. Jesus said, if you're going to be like me, then you have to become a servant. If you want to be great in my kingdom, you've got to be the servant of all. It, you can't become a servant until you start serving. So you can, you've got a choice to make. You can sit and soak and sour, or you can serve. <laughs> Either way, you're going to stink. Either way, you're going to stink. But at least you get to work up a sweat while you're serving, and, and it becomes a sweet aroma. Thank you for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to connect with us further, we offer a variety of platforms to choose from. We'd love to have you here on our campus in downtown Bremen, or you can join us on social media, you can join us on our live stream, or on our radio broadcast at KISS 102.7 every Sunday morning at 1030. 